But thank you all very much for coming on a wet and windy Monday morning. It's great that Eric is here. I, mean, I think housing is one of the key social and economic issues uh, both now and in the run for the next election. It's actually one of the top five issues for the last three months when you did this polling on what are the key issues facing Britain. Voters put housing as number five, and I think that's a huge turnaround from a few years ago. Uh, there's a general political agreement that we do need to build more homes. Um, we're building around 100 to 130,000, um, which is better than it was at the very trough of the recession, but it isn't uh, enough to meet demand. And self-build, um, we published something called uh, a right to build earlier this year, arguing that uh, this was a good way to increase the amount of homes being built in Britain. In most other developed countries, self-build is uh, either a majority or close to a majority of new housing. Uh, in Britain, it's around 10%. So in 2011, the Coalition uh, did the first move on this, uh, put through something in the National Planning Policy Framework, saying you had to monitor local demand for self-build housing. Uh, that hasn't yet managed to push up numbers um, sufficiently. So Eric, uh, I think, is here to talk through the, the recent plans about how the Coalition intends to continue to build on this. Jack Drogi was also going to be here to put the Labour case, it's something they're very interested in. Uh, unfortunately, a week is a long time in politics uh, and he was reshuffled. However, both uh, Hilary Benn and Ella Reynolds are in their constituencies or at engagements, so they haven't been able to put someone up, uh, which is uh, unfortunate, but the way politics goes. Um, after Eric speaks, there'll be a short Q&A, uh, and then there's going to be a panel discussion uh, on custom build, self-build, both uh, what the government's doing already, uh, and is there anything more that the government could do. Uh, and now I'll hand over to Eric, who is, no introduction is necessary, as Secretary of State at DCLG. He's one of the key political figures in this government, uh, and it's great to have him here. Uh, I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Very much. I was very much uh, admiring the new uh, backdrop to the policy exchange, just in case you had a moment of confusion and wondered where you were. Uh, now, um, we all recognise that the nation faces an acute housing shortage. Uh, too many young people are able uh, to flee from their parents' nest. Too many uh, families uh, are stuck in a home that's overgrown. I mean, after the uh, collapse of house building and the last uh, government's watch, we've pushed prices, which put prices far beyond the reach of many hard working families. But speaking softly, speaking gently, that the situation is being turned around. Thanks to the success of Help to Buy, it's revived the right to buy and helping people uh, realise their dreams of home ownership. The number of first-time buyers are now back at the highest level since the economic collapse. And house building rates have climbed too. With over 150,000 affordable houses since the election, with many more uh, to come. House building starts are up by a third uh, since this time last year. And houses have been built at a quicker rate uh, for a decade. Instead of targets, which frankly <coughs> build nothing but resentment, we're giving councils, um, which build homes, a financial boost. We're invested in bringing back empty homes into use. We've reformed the planning system to accelerate rather than to stifle development. The result has been a renewed confidence among developers and buyers alike. And it's breathing new life into the market. But something else has to happen too. Something which has largely gone under the radar. And that's a blossoming of an interest for people wanting to build their own homes. Under the last government, absolutely nothing was done to support these aspirations. And I think it's recognised that, that was a big mistake. It's well known that the desire for home ownership is hardwired into the British DNA. But so many people don't just dream of home, of home ownership, they dream of building their home as well. Custom building has traditionally been seen as a preserve of those with deep pockets. And speaking of someone who just had his house replastered, I can tell you any building 
project requires very deep pockets indeed. Uh, but while for some people self-building means a grand design style project, many people have more modest ambitions and let's consider the other benefits too. The boost to local construction and jobs, especially among small businesses. In some countries, as uh, you've rightly pointed out in the introduction, Austria, Belgium, Sweden, as much as half of the new housing is custom built. Likewise, in Germany, there's a strong tradition of cooperative building. And I refuse to believe that there are any more ambitious or creative than the British. But they have systems which support and <coughs> encourage and reward self-building. We must do likewise. In the past, self-builders found themselves tangled, tangled up in a red tape before they've ever managed to get going at all. They had to bang their heads against brick walls in a system which was designed to put them off. This government, which believes in supporting ambition, in fact, more people who build their own homes, the better. So we're addressing the problem which makes people hesitate. Obviously the first problem is the lack of affordable <coughs> land, which a potential, uh, the poten which potential self-builders say is the number one stumbling block. By selling off government owned land and encouraging councils to do the same, not every household site uh, will, will be like uh, Cranbrook in Exeter, which is going to deliver 6,000 homes. There are going to be some plots which are perfect for small projects and for self building. The second problem that people face is red tape. We've changed the planning system. So the first time, councils must take into account the need for self building as part of their overall uh, housing plans. And finally, and probably most important of all, the money, or lack of it. We're working with lenders to help would-be self-builders get, get access to the finance they need. And because we believe that custom building should not be the preserve of the elite and the wealthy, we're offering £47 million pounds worth of loans to aspiring self-builders and community groups. We've also set up a website dedicated to guide people for the practical process of uh, DIY house building. And we have Kevin McLeod working with us as the industry's champion. And to see those, uh, their dreams come, come within reach. So as a result, the mortgage market for self-building is now more than a billion pounds. There are over 50 councils supporting self-builders, making land available, supporting individuals and community groups for the schemes. There, there was even 7,000 custom-built projects last year. That's around 1 in 10 of all the new homes in the country. A 4 billion uh, boost for the national uh, economy. And we believe we can go further that with that support and with that nurture. The custom build industry can double its size over the next few years. And we can make this mainstream option not just a minority interest. So that's why we will uh, increase more the, the, the land available with planning guides that ask councils to actively assess the demand for self build in their area. Councils will put together a register of interested people who can benefit when suitable land becomes available. We will also carry out a review of the Homes and Communities uh, Agency line to identify more land that is suitable for small scale projects and to publicise what would be self builders. And we will strengthen the community rights to reclaim land so that more public owned land is sold off and brought back into use. And we will remove even more the red tape. We rightly ask big developers to make a financial contribution to roads, to schools, to parks, to surgeries. Now, that uh, needed as part of a uh, parcel of large scale housing developments. 
but frankly it's ludicrous to ask sales builders to pay up in the same way. So we've introduced a council tax discount for self build family annexes and, we've, and we also want to exempt self builders from a reasonable section of 106 charges and for community infrastructure level, potentially saving uh, self builders thousands of pounds, making projects that would otherwise be unaffordable at an unrealistic, uh, and become an unrealistic choice. And we will even do more to increase the balance available by working with lenders to extend help to buy schemes. For those who want to build their homes, we've put aside £65 million pounds of affordable homes guarantee programme potentially up for grabs by community groups. Unlike the uh, opposition, who have done nothing but warm words and empty promises for self builders, this government just truly sees the potential of the market to help families realise their aspirations, to create jobs and support small businesses, and to make a real contribution to meeting our housing needs now and in the future. We're taking practical steps, which will unlock the potential and we want to uh, turn our, our, um, our country, which is famously a nation of shopkeepers, to one of a nation of self-builders too. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I'm very happy to answer any questions anybody has. Who would like to be first? So. Um, my name is Brett Hanford from The Builder. My name is Brett Hamford from the Builders Merchants Federation. Uh, many of our businesses like self and custom build because they're one of the few friends they've got to help with estimating of materials and the labour. Uh, my question really is to ask you to really concentrate on brownfield land. Uh, the, the news about HGA is welcome, but it really has to be brownfield land. It's all very well self building in the wilds of sort of East Anglia, Wessex, the very far north country, but it has to be brownfield, urban land. If you could do anything to help customers and merchants, we'd be very, very grateful. I'm sure you're right, but perhaps you might take to play why brownfield land is so important. Um, the, the reason why I ask the question is because um, as you trailed, the question of um, land becomes available that is not normally known uh, by small self customers They wouldn't know these parcels of land exist. And if they do, they tend to be in such bigger <coughs> units, maybe um, ex-army, you know, ex yeah. ex and it's and so it is that that kind of Russian dolls breaking it down, yeah. uh, as as you know, Ted Stevens and his people on your websites. But th that is why it's much more relevant because in the say where Richard Baker who does some work on this, mm. you know, it's easy to build in East Anglia. It's easy to build in the very very far north country because mm. there's plenty of open land. Mm. That's my thinking. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the camera you said uh, 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 add a number of passes on to make it easier. And of course, the advantage of uh, self build is it lends itself to this kind of development, which uh, uh, perhaps wouldn't be attractive to a larger development. Plus, also, people who uh, want to self build generally don't want to be part of a larger estate. And we are hoping to encourage people building affordable houses in a cooperative manner. Who would like to be next? So, another gentleman back. Hi, uh, Rory Meek from Taxpayers Alliance. Um, it's really good to hear about um, how you're removing the CIO, CIL and um, Section 106 from uh, self-build because these taxes essentially um, do have a very constricting effect on, on supply. So it's, it's very good to hear that in this section of the market there have been at least there, there have been uh, 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 cut back. Um, but I have two questions. One is, um, what about the effect that they have on the rest of the market? Because as being taxes on development, they still have a restricting effect on supply and are still reducing the amount of supply. And secondly, within existing homes, part of the problem is stamp duty is, is holding back people from selling and holding back older people whose kids have left the home from perhaps where it's in there, would have been their interest to sell and move to a smaller home. Well, even given that the mm -hmm. Chancellor is currently in China, and therefore an enormous distance between myself and him, <laughs> 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 at least the middle of the afternoon there. 
there is absolutely no way I'm going to tread on this, um, this, this territory. I've stumped you, Tim. <laughs> but perhaps it might be helpful if, if I just say a little bit about um, uh, the community infrastructure level, let me, and, um, and 106. Because I think it's been the creep of 106 that for what was something regarded as being quite a good thing has become almost uh, planning by road. And sometimes if you look on some of the larger developments and sometimes on the not so large developments, often the 106 conditions just go three or four pages and sometimes seem to be gratuitous. Now the idea really in terms of sale uh, was to replace as much of 106 as you could get now, when I first um, came into office, I said that we should apply a cherry picker test uh, to 106, uh, which essentially, if you go to the top of the cherry picker, look around. If you can't see um, uh, the uh, uh, the land, it should uh, 106 shouldn't apply to it. Um, so I'm hoping to really try and create 106, so it's so it's actually development absolutely specific. Now, of course, um, uh, small uh, building plots um, uh, do um, have costs on the community, but I think it, small building, the advantage of having small building builders on it, um, actually outweighs the need for that like, community infrastructure level. The gentleman right at the back. Um, my name is Simon McGuire. I work for a developer called Hab Housing and Custom Builds, a big component of our business plan. Uh, it's obviously welcome to use your unconscious tax discounts and potential 106 and civil exemption for self-builders. I just haven't seen uh, enough clarity in policy yet to determine whether that's going to apply to custom build as well, that range of exemptions. So if we are delivering a self-builder's home for them by guiding and enabling them, will those exemptions also apply? Well, I think we'll, um, yeah, I think it will apply, but it has to apply to the individual and for these um, uh, discounts to occur we'd have to show proof that it was uh, part of um, uh, a, a person doing that, that self-build. Uh, obviously um, if we didn't do that then it would be opened up to gaming. And the last thing we want is people playing sort of, uh, uh, gaming uh, to get the play off government where it isn't actually self-build but part of a small development. So. Uh, Chris Brown from Igloo Regeneration, uh, like Simon, a uh, uh, custom build enabler. Um, if we're going to do the, the volumes of houses that we need in this country, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands probably, um, self build is probably not going to get us there because it's quite hard work and there aren't that many people who can, who can do it. How are we going to um, scale it up to those very much larger numbers that they do overseas? And in particular, do you think you can encourage public landowners to play a part in that? Well, we are actually asking uh, some of the uh, larger uh, owners, in particular uh, the uh, Home and Community Agency, to examine the possibility. And actually, I think, uh, going back to the earlier point that was made, uh, uh, the Homes and Community own big tracks, but they also have individual and really small sites. We're hoping that that might be a way in which we can uh, release it. So it's a combination of the fiscal encouragements, um, a looser uh, planning uh, regime, uh, and hopefully we can bring, you know, if we doubled the amount, it still wouldn't be enormously significant in the way it is in the um, uh, in continental Europe, where I'm really trying to get it to, to a point where it might be able to take off. So, you know, we want to get it onto that plateau in order for it to take off, and I regard that as a bit of a success. Who else would like to ask? Gentleman there. Uh, Clifford Lawrence. Uh, do you have any... Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, um, do you, uh, we know you're concerned about the length of time it takes for large planning decisions to go through. And, um, we are both aware of ones that have taken literally a decade from start to finish. Do you have any further plans to... I know you mentioned you wanted all decisions to be done within 12 months, which you did mention yeah. that. Um, the, Every time, forgive me, a politician says this, it just seems to get worse rather than better. Well, that is, that is basically part of our uh, raison d'etre. <laughs> <laughs> it is not intentional. <laughs> I do know that. Uh, some of it, of course, is European Union uh, legislation, so large environmental statements, that sort of thing. Yeah. 
Um, is there any way, I mean, uh, uh, you and I will both be aware of a large development in Hertfordshire where developers finally withdrew, I think, 12 and a half years to 13 years after they made the application. They've been through several inquiries. Um, eventually, their options ran out. Yeah. So they just dumped it. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, um, the, sh will, the world group produces of the wrong statistics relatively reasonable, relatively soon, which shows that it is starting to improve, but I think in t for it to properly improve, we need to do a couple of things. First of all, the 106 that we just talked about, and this potpourri of, uh, of conditions. I think we need to be very firm about ensuring that, um, that the 106 uh, conditions are important and not decorative. And I have to say there is some suggestion that's the case. I think we actually need to improve the, um, the discussions before the application uh, um, uh, uh, is there. And um, we are looking towards simplifying the process um, uh, with deep consents um, as we get uh, to kind of truncate that whole process. But that will have benefits not only um, with uh, large developments, but it will also have benefits with smaller developments. Uh, though um, a, a lot of um, uh, self-builders will be um, uh, exempt from all this sort of business anyway. So, let, you're next, my dear chum. I won't go without... Oh, there we are. <laughs> 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 no, no, please, after you. Well, thank you. Uh, John, you my, my uh, worry is that any initiative seems to have side effects, and in the same way that some people worry that the help to buy a scheme might you know, uh, provoke a housing battle, would self build. The problem is surely the reluctance of an awful lot of communities to accept uh, planning, and that was what's sometimes referred to as the NIMBY syndrome. Basically, how do we strike the balance? How do we get it right? Well, I, I, I th it's my experience. To, uh, before I came into this job and since, that actually the level of resistance to self-build small development is much, uh, much less than some of the larger uh, developments. But I think it's up to politicians to take some leadership. I mean, the truth is, Conservatives want to see more house building taking place, Liberal Democrats want to see more house building taking place, um, uh, Liberal Democrats want to see more. Um, everybody does. So anybody that really says, you know, we can stop house building um, as a political party are a bunch of scoundrels. Um, and I think politicians need to show some leadership and not use the planning system as a way of avoiding decisions. You know, with new development comes new possibilities, um, new things for local people. Um, more houses mean that local shops are much more viable. Uh, and the MPPF does give local people an opportunity to actually determine where the development goes and to mould that development. So that's the thing we want is sort of a great sort of um, homogeneous, uh, um, pasteurised housing all over the country. We want to retain uh, the feel of those communities and to enhance those communities. And now the politest person in the room. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, Mike, Mike then from the Masonry Alliance. Um, two, two quick questions for May. Firstly, in relation to the, um, uh, the, the, the um, self build fund that you talked about, £65 um, million, pounds, um, I wonder how that could be directed towards community affordable schemes using charitable spaces like Jericho and people like that. We've, we're trying to get schemes like that off the ground in different parts of the country. Um, and, and some fund priming for that would be really, really helpful because that gets young unemployed people into uh, back into the workplace and, uh, and building homes. So that's quite constructive. Um, the, the second thing really was um, around the whole agenda of self. I've been close to self build for you know, 30 years. I so was very young. Um, that um, my, my concern about it really now is that it's evolved and actually it's, it's small builders that's the issue. We need to get small builders back into the market. They will build a lot, a lot of these homes. They're short of finance, they can't get the finance in. Um, it would be really, really helpful um, obviously the chance to away in China if you could uh, announce the strapping of Silk uh, 106 to all the loans under 1 to 5. 
Well, I could probably could do it, but it would be an interesting to, uh, to announce my resignation from the government. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, the, the, uh, the 65 million uh, pounds are, it is for affordable housing and it is to work cooperatively. Uh, it's not there to fund uh, uh, existing um, small um, housing associations, it's, it's there to, um, for, for exactly what it says on the side of the tent. Uh, but we are scrapping um, uh, 106 and, and, and so for small, for self build, and um, providing it, it's not um, uh, kind of a tricksy uh, scheme that's put up. Uh, to make it look like it's self-built, but it isn't self-built, then that should, should, should help the process. And I think you know, what we're looking for is to have variety available in house building. And you're right, I mean, one of the saddest features, I think, of, um, of uh, the declining house building of the last uh, uh, decade or so is to see the, small, the number of small firms disappear now. A lot of those have gone, and they ain't going to come back. And uh, what we need to do is to protect those that have managed to do the same and to encourage uh, small developers back into the business. Hi, um, sorry. And you can be. <laughs> Paula Higgins, Homeowners Alliance. Um, it's great that you know, you're supporting South Build and you're doing a lot of stuff on the demand side measures for housing but we haven't been building enough homes for 30 years. I mean, I think, we, are there any big ideas to actually, although house building is increasing, we're still at a very low, low base, and uh, we're starting up a lot of problems for the future. Any big ideas, what about garden cities, new towns, that sort of stuff? But I can't think, the important thing is to be able to get us off the bottom, and we're now off the bottom and starting to move. In terms of the, 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 the sums that are required, I mean, the last time we built those kind of numbers were in the mid-19, 70s, and um, the government certainly has no intention of imposing um, compulsory garden cities. But there are a number of um, authorities uh, who are looking to expand, and if those who wish to expand um, would, uh, would like to do so, then we would certainly be very helpful in that process. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, sort of the grandiose plans, Getting house building moving along, getting the level of, um, of people, first time buyers up, getting the number of completions so that's something that has been very much a part of the last year and that wasn't ach achieved by a single kind of silver bullet. It's been putting together a, um, a collection uh, of, of policies for us to do so. so. Thank you. Um, Alan Evans. University of Reading, and I'm also a resident in Harrow on the Hill. Um, uh, it's a point, a comment really, uh, on this, in respect to the amount of self build over the past few years. Yeah. Um, because what the British have done is extended their homes. In, in Harrow on the Hill, I would think 50% of the houses have been extended. Certainly, yeah. my house you know, started off as a three bedroom house. My wife, wife's you know, happily converted it into a four bedroom, two bathroom house with a, with a large living room at the back. Um, and so that was, you know, she was never happier than self-building. Um, so it seems to me that we, you know, maybe, maybe in the other countries that you mentioned, they didn't go for, for extend, home extension, but home extension has certainly gone in, in, on in this country, basically from an economic, going back to being an economist, because the price of land is so high that it becomes worthwhile extending and not moving. And that may be the reason for the difference between this country and the other countries. Thank you. Well, you could be right, but then again, as you're an economist, you could be wrong. I was never happier than when I had my arm in a sling. I was then a one-handed economist. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Uh, but I mean, you could, you could, well, that could well be a factor. That could explain some differences. But nevertheless, helping self-build uh, to uh, uh, move along and to uh, increase the uh, availability and also to take care of a lot of uh, smaller sites, um, brownfield sites that otherwise might not be available. Uh, I think that's something that we should encourage and indeed we've encouraged uh, um, uh, extensions with uh, some tax relief. And this will sadly have to be the final question. Gentlemen, yeah. 
Hi, Ted Stevens from the National self Borders Association. Um, in most of those other countries, it's very commonplace to for people to be able to buy a building block, which is facilitated mainly by the local authorities. They acquire the land, they split it in the plots, and they sell them at reasonable prices. Now, the policy exchange came up with an idea a bit like that, encouraging councils to perhaps hold auctions to get the land as cheaply as possible and then split it up. What's your view on that? Is there any chance we might see some pilots like that trial? Well, I well, would we very much encourage local authorities to do that. We would have to be on a voluntary basis. Well, my dear friends, thank you very much for turning up. And uh, I'm sorry if I made you dizzy. We're moving backwards and forwards about <laughs> back this wonderful backdrop. Um, <laughs> congratulations to Paul's Exchange. And we will disappear. Thank you. Thank you. Not the end. We have a panel of discussion, uh, a panel discussion including Yolanda Barnes, Hilda Savills, uh, Ted Stevens, who runs the National Silk Association, uh, Richard Abbott, uh, who helps create a waiting list and uh, facilitate land transfer, and Matt Griffiths, who runs an organisation called Priced Out, which deals with all this. So we just to hear what they think the uh, implications of all this will be. And we'll start off with you, Ted. Uh, what do you think about? State had to say. Um, well, it's really. Oh, sorry, you introduce yourself first okay. and then perhaps. Uh, uh, I'm Ted Stevens, I run the thing for the National Self Court Association, and uh, we represent the uh, army of people who want to build their own homes and the growing number of custom built developers that are um, getting involved in making that happen. Um, I think um, it was reassuring to hear. Eric say things that some of the other ministers have said in the past, um, confirming the sort of rumours that Section 106 is, would um, definitely uh, uh, no longer apply for self-builders. The, the SIL exemption is hugely welcome, and, it, and it's fair to say, um, you know, the, the, the current um, government's been incredibly supportive from, from uh, particularly Grant Shapps through to uh, Chris um, and, and Nick Bowles as well, all I think very keen on. Uh, encouraging more self and custom built. Uh, but it's, it's also, I mean, uh, they're not here today, but the Labour Party, I think, uh, supports it just as strong. And, um, uh, you know, there, there is a sort of, I think, sort of waking up to the fact that there's been this sort of small um, but uh, passionate group of people who desperately want to build their own mm -hmm. homes. We did a survey with Moray um, in January, and that suggested that there were six million people in Britain who would like to do it and are researching it at the moment, trying to figure out where they can afford to build the sort of homes they would want to build and that sort of stuff. And all those six million, one million have done the research and want to buy a home, create a home, get a site uh, within the next 12 months. The reality is that 99 out of 100 of those won't do it. Um, only about 10,000 people build the home at the moment. And there's, there's four things that stop them. Um, the biggest by a country mile is getting land. Uh, it's four times as high a hurdle as anything else for self-builders. Um, and uh, until that's really addressed, I don't think you're going to see a sudden, massive increase. Um, the second hurdle is getting planning permission. Currently, if you're a self-builder, most of the plots that you get a chance of buying tend to be the sort of quirky ones that nobody else is interested in. The big volume house builders aren't prepared to do them. And so, do you, do you think, sorry, do you think the point that it's easy to build in play, I mean, I, 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 easy to build on greenfield sites? Uh, um, I, I, I don't think it is easy to build on greenfield sites, though I think Eric was right in saying that most local authorities will get fewer objections to a self built scheme for local people than it will for a bigger um, executive home scheme from one of the volume house builders. I think there's less in the of, uh, directed towards self builders. So getting land, making land available is the biggest um, challenge. Planning is the second one. It surprised me. I thought it would be finance, but planning is just by whisker the second biggest hurdle. Um, and that's, I think, really due to the fact that it's so hard to find a site. Any site you do find has usually got all sorts of complications, and you have to battle your way through that. And then it's getting finance. Um, in the, uh, you know, we helped uh, with uh, uh, Shatz put together, as, and his team put together a sort of action plan to grow the sector. And um, just before uh, Mark Prisk um, disappeared, we presented a, a sort of progress report to him. And the four things we called for there were fundamentally more land. Things like the HCA making more sites available will help, not just for individual self-builders, but for the growing number of volume 
um, custom built companies, people like Chris's company, Igloo, you know, these are serious um, development companies who their model doesn't work on a site for 10 homes, it works on a site for 100 homes, giving people lots of different options on those sites. So we want some big sites, we want all those little small micro sites that the HCA offers made available. I was at a conference last week, a guy was over from Holland, and there all the public sector sites like that are, are marked as a really simple single website. You can go to it, you can see what it's allowed or not allowed, what it's going to cost. And it's a breeze to acquire. Um, if the HCA can do something like that, that will have a transformational effect. But I would also encourage councils to do what um, has been suggested by the policy exchange here. Uh, we know one or two councils who don't have land at the moment, but they want to encourage self-build. So they're going out to acquire land. They're effectively having a sort of reverse auction, saying to landowners, if you've got land and you want to sell it and you're desperate, then sell it to us at the lowest price and you also have a reverse auction. The ones who offer you the, the council the price, the land at the lowest price, they'll sell it to the council. The council will then cut it up into individual plots and sell it to people. So you end up with reasonably affordable plots for the self-builders. So I'd encourage more councils to look at that. I think Nick Bowles is right on the money when it comes to simplifying the planning system, and I know there's a lot going through and more to come there. Um, at the moment, about one in five, one in six of local authorities seems to be doing something supportive of self build I'd like that to be six out of six rather than one out of six. Um, and I think there's also a bit of a job to be done to explain what custom build means. People use the term self build and custom build, and I bet half the people in this room would struggle to define what the two really mean. I think we're nearly there in terms of a definition, but until the great public out there start knocking on the doors of custom-built developers and others saying, could I have a custom-built home as opposed to a self-built home, and people really understand that, I think you know, we won't get the demand really flowing through. But um, you know, I'm encouraged by Eric reinforcing what his, uh, his ministers have said. Um, I think there is the big thing is getting more land coming through, and that, uh, that'll, that'll make it really change in terms of the scale of it. Uh, I think I may as well go sort of across. Uh, Matt, so land's the one issue, and the point about the politics is interesting. And as priced out, we've seen an organisation that represents people who are yet to um, own a property and are struggling and worried about it. Sometimes it just seems to me that there's a, a natural fit between you and Ted that Ted has the product and you have the people who would like to be able to deliver it. If there was a way of connecting that at a local level and applying pressure, if the government isn't going to do that from the top, it's going to have to be almost on a council-by-council council basis. Yeah. I mean, the politics of self-build work. Um, <coughs> we, at present, are trying to campaign for new homes at local authority level. People usually, in the public debate that surrounds that, in local newspapers, in letters, in discussions with councillors, people very rarely say, I don't want a new house because um, uh, I don't want new housing because of the value of my own. They couch it in more emotive terms, and, and typically the arguments we run into are around we don't want new housing for incomers, um, just read any housing story in the comments below it to see the power of that one. Or it's we don't want to give up new land for big developments. Um, and those are quite, that's how those, both those arguments have powerful emotive traction in the public debate, and it's quite hard to counter those. But self-build enables you to do so. Um, in that you can potentially, if, if they're awaiting this in the local council, ground it in a kind of lo housing for local people agenda, which is really important. And you can also get the discussion away from major house builders' profit margins and towards questions of quality and uh, type, of, uh, type of build. So the politics of it works, and it's really encouraging, um, and, and it should be pushed. Um, the concern for me is really about the actual availability of land and the local authorities' appetite for doing this. In March 2012, the government came out with new guidance in the MPPF around self-build. It said local authorities should consider and assess the need for self-building. Um, and basically, that isn't happening. Um, as Ted said, it's only one in five. So 80% of local authorities aren't do it, doing it. Those local authorities that are key, or certainly from a general deliver more housing perspective, tend to be big city authorities which have more land pressures upon them. Um, so it's really hard for young people who want to self-build to get to know what to do in those situations. If local authorities aren't coming up with a list of 
potential sites for Seth Build. It's very hard to break open into a land market. Um, it's very hard to deal with the planning system, which takes five, ten years to get into. And it's very hard to know what to do if you can't ask national governments to appeal, uh, to, to put in, in place some kind of sanction against local authorities who aren't going to deliver. Whether it's saying you must have a waiting list over a particular period of time, um, or having a sanction if they don't do so, say set up an alternative waiting list. Under the current system, essentially, the only area where campaigns like ours work are local authorities that kind of get it anyway, and it's quite a marginal group. For those local authorities who face much stronger demographic pressures against new housing, um, and, or, or are dealing with the Greenfield issue, um, you have to have a really massive campaign to get them to sway them to change their mind. And with no central government support, that becomes much harder. So you want, can I just add, I mean, there are 50 councils, and to be fair to those 50, between them, they're bringing forward at the moment about 4,000 self put opportunities. I reckon at least half of those would be affordable. Half of them might be, you know, bigger homes for retired old toughers like me, but for a good half of them are aimed at people of modest, modest incomes. And so there are some big schemes coming down the pipeline now in Oxfordshire and Bristol and places like that, which will deliver lots of, I think, really quite modestly priced homes. The other thing I was going to say, last week we ran a competition for designing a house on a shoe street. The winning design was 41 grand to build a 100 square metre house. You, know, you can do it incredibly cheaply. You have to build it. That's maybe the materials cost, but you can you can create incredibly uh, decent sized homes for quite a modest amount if you're hard working and uh, you've got a bit of creative um, mouse. I'm doing a very quick back in the end of calculation, which obviously is a uh, think tank we never do. But um, so you've got 50 out of 300 or so local authorities. If you scale that up, you get to 24,000 plots, which would actually be the doubling that within the next two years that Eric was talking about. So yeah. basically, you get, if all councils are actually doing waiting lists in the sort of getting a limited land through, that would actually get us to where we need to be, which is quite an interesting But, but you, need, you need the sort of political leadership. Yes. If the council leader is passionate to do it, it happens. If they aren't, Unless, of course, the central government, happens. actually, the central government, of course, did the planning spectrum has ways to make sure that people do the things that the guy that sells them is the question of which levers are yep. being pulled at any one point in time, because there's so much planning guidance, the government invariably has to select which bits it's enforcing at any one moment in time. The question then becomes, is this one of the leaders that they should be pulling on hardest? But so, to go to London, one thing that did sort of interest me was that if you exempt uh, self build from Section 106 and SIN, that should theoretically mean that it's preferential as a landowner, you could capitalise some of that back into the land value and actually get a higher land view. So someone coming to you and saying, we want to do a self build site, could actually offer you slightly more than they would have been able to because they prefer the taxes that are large to Do you think that, that might? help a little bit around the margin of the market dynamics? Theoretically, perhaps, but I think we're talking far too small here. Yeah. And um, for me, um, in this conversation, there's a big gap missing. And when we're talking about uh, self-procurement as a means of delivery overseas, being about half of the market in most European countries, um, we're clearly not talking about small, keen self-builders building a grand design or even, dare I say, the small community projects that um, are custom built. We're talking about quite a different method of delivery, another route to market which we just haven't experienced in this country. And if you start looking, um, not just in Europe, but in the US as well, you find that the common denominator here is the separation, dare I say, of, of land development and building houses. And I think we have the two incredibly conflated when we're talking about self-build in this country or, or about mass house building. We tend to think of development as, as all being the same thing. Whereas I think uh, if you look to overseas models, and there are many, many different ones, the common denominator is that land is being developed and brought forward as a separate entity without getting nearly so hung up on the product as we probably do, do here, at least in, in, in the initial instance. So um, the SIL and, um, and taxation and so forth is, is relevant, I think, in as much as it can act as a lever or a carrot or a stick in actually providing that land and bringing it forward. And what we have to be talking about here is land that wouldn't otherwise be developed. 
Um, so I think the brownfield issue is a very valid and interesting one and, 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 and pertinent. Because what I see is that any viable site, where, um, if it's viable for a sample, though it's probably viable generally for um, uh, some kind of a commercial entity as well, will be snapped up. So high value areas, any land is going to be snapped up and done. The real challenge is where, I, I know of sites, and, and you don't have to go very far, to see sites that for 10,000 units may be fully planning permission that are just sitting there because the, the scale is just impossible to deliver using conventional, even so-called mass house building methods. And if we're going to um, get additional housing over and above the capacity, the capability of either the self-built sector, it may, be a double, it may be double the number, it may be 130,000, 150,000 from the speculative house builders, we've actually got to find another 100,000 or so from somewhere else. And I think, um, we have to look overseas at how plots, service plots, perhaps design could it, perhaps even planning permission, with um, definite product, and maybe even kind of kit homes, a, a, def, a, a, you know, a certain product, being provided to people who, as an alternative to uh, the, the normal routes to market. Uh -huh. So it's a self-procurement, what I call a, a build to own market rather than the things that we've been talking so about. So almost, almost uh, the, yeah, looking at, so there are other countries where you, the, the local council gets a very large site that you couldn't rapidly build out if you were a typical UK house builder, you just stop to wipe the plots and then pass it on to customers who are prepared to take, who have a completely different model and then you develop products that help that. You, you see that as a future in some ways. It is a common feature but it doesn't have to be a municipality. In North America it is bespoke land developers. The interesting thing about whether it's public sector or private sector or indeed third sector is that it tends to be a long-term landowner with an interest in ongoingly managing the place. you like, maybe we ought to be thinking about creating new modern landed estates, as it were, whoever owns them, because uh, there's this need for, so it's very, very difficult for an individual with no experience, I mean, it's difficult enough if you have experience of the sector, but if you have no experience of planning or, or development or whatever, to ask an individual household to go into the hugely regulated um, nightmare that is development in the, in, well, in, probably in any country, um, and do it all, I think is a ridiculous ask, actually. And so we've got to look to entities and encourage entities, whether, I don't know whether it's going to be tax concessions or you know, what sort of counts and sticks, but really look imaginatively at ways to encourage landowners to actively promote land into plots. And by plots, I, you know, it could be a show and call tower block, it could be a, it could be terraced housing, it doesn't have to be standalone sort of grand designs at all. There's been that all. I was going to say, that's what they do in the, the Netherlands at the moment, and whilst the traditional private developer house building market is pretty much on its back, they've been churning out um, plots for self-builders um, uh, like there's no tomorrow, and they've made it so easy. You go to the high street into the plot shop, and you can look at the plots that are available, and you can buy a plot for 25 grand, and there's kit home companies there with different standard houses, and uh, you can customise those. The whole thing is Pain, painfully easy compared to the nightmare most self-builders face over here. What, what interests me is that that would, to, that would not completely, but that would help de-risk parts of the housing market in that you would have a stream that was probably less volatile than the certain expected house builders who are extremely volatile in this country. That if you had what you're talking about and you could do things through neighbourhood plans and other ways to get sort of local consent through a large company that then facilitates it, that that would create a stream that is both it probably be able to churn out quite high numbers, but would be a stream that would be much less volatile than the current uh, sort of speculative house build that sort of shoots up a bit, then plunges down, then goes up a bit, then plunges down. Well, but potentially so. I mean, my argument is really that the, uh, the, uh, the annual return on capital employed type model of the house builders is inadequate to delivering long-term land. That's, that's it in essence, really. Uh, Richard, uh, I thought the, the point about the waiting lists and trying to get the HTA and public land and trying to connect those two, I mean, if you want to do stuff yeah, briefly, sure. but one of the things that I was excited when I met you was the idea that you don't, not all this has to come from government, but actually, you, again, you can have people who are sort of helping on, on the ground with land and waiting lists and driving that through. Absolutely, um, what we're about to site three is actually um, 
kind of the bit before Kevin McLeod turns up, not the, not the grand design, the difficult bit of you know, finding the land and uh, getting the plan commission, as we've been talking about. And what we're trying to do is work with local authorities and HCA and other bodies, not that there's other very, other very large landowners in the country to actually bring some of those plots forward. And as, as we've said, divide them into manageable plots, and that might be for a grand design, it might be for road uh, five terraces. Um, and if we can do that and then put those plots out, so people can understand it. What we're effectively talking about is setting up the plot shop, so people can understand what they're buying. We know how we know what the planning situation is. You know, we can get planning permission from what they can't. You know, if there's a big sewer running through it, or if there's a back sitting, whatever. You, you've got all that, that information is there. So when people buy that land, they know what to expect, what it's going to cost them, how long things are going to take. And, uh, presumably, you might do some metrics. One of the things that interests me is if the five out of six councils that are doing this. If, for example, you have you know that there are five people on your website yeah. who want who you know could get mortgage finance, so you've done a bit of betting. It seems to me that that is a waiting list, and it, there is no reason why you could not, at the centre government, say there is a waiting list in your area. The fact that you haven't done it uh, doesn't prove the fact that there is one. I think I think, I think we already know from tertiary research. We already know there's a waiting list. There's many people out there looking for plots. We don't, we um, we probably know where they are. So we I think not. I think we need that waiting list, but I think. We, we don't. We shouldn't be waiting for the waiting. Yes. The, the, the local authority should be looking at it. I think there's a couple of things on this <coughs> so that the local authority needs and HCA and other parties need to be moving forward with that. Um, I think also when HCA and local authorities do have land, I think they should look at not look at self build as a last resort. They should look at it in the round with developer plots because actually in some cases they're selling those plots individually to local to self builders may actually bring higher value than selling 100 plots to, you know, to We did some research, your average self would pay you 30% more for a plot than you'd get if you were flogging that to one of the volume house builders. Volume house builders are really good at buying land, they know yeah. how to do it. And um, your average self builder, because he isn't, and he's struggling, and he's tearing his hair out trying to find a site, will pay a premium for the site. So. Um, you know, there's a, there's a financial benefit for councils who do that. Yeah, it's perhaps worth mentioning, I'm working on a model at the moment where I think there's enough um, slack in the game that you could actually uh, bring people into the market who otherwise wouldn't have ac access to the market because they have been what, only got a 5 or 10% deposit, where you could actually uh, pay a fuller than uh, average uh, land price to the landowner if the landowner is prepared to for example, give a license to build, it hinges around giving a license to build for the build period uh, without taking a receipt. But providing that the, the finished product is mortgageable and at full, full value, the landowner can get a higher than average return, uh, the contractor can get paid with a margin, and you can turn a 5 to 10% deposit into a 25% deposit. I'm going to open it. Oh, I'll let you say one thing, then I'm going to open up for questions for the last like. 10 to 15 minutes. Well, it's just a, a query how this system would work in where you have a, a five year land supply. Presumably, by the time land is in the land supply, if it's, it's in that land supply, it will more than likely be in a short term land bank, or if not, it will be optioned by a big developer. So, where, where's the spare capacity within that to, to give land? Yeah, there is a problem with, with if, if it's sort of the government's going to make new land available and you have a five year supply, mm -hmm. by definition, most of the sites within the ease of the most mm -hmm. developable probably or also will be in the by the land supplies. So there is an interesting problem of how in the current system, unless, unless, unless the council is prepared to say, as part of this five year land supply, we will, some of it is earmarked for self build if it's just the government's going to say, new land supply, that's great, but actually there isn't much new land supply because most of it is in the five year plans, because that's what the five year plans do, they the most developable sites. So there is a, a sort of bit of a problem there, I think. We've, but, we've, um, we've actually been speaking with, with one of the major house builders, and what they're saying is if they've got a Development of 200 houses. If on day one they sold 10 self build plots, that mm -hmm. money they bring in, they want to put them with anything else, probably pay for the road. So actually. So Tony Pitty is your best, sorry, uh, Tony Pitty in the other Well, no, your it's, best actually, it's not Barkers, but I think actually <laughs> what local authorities put some pressure on to, uh, as part of Section 106 or part of the uh, affordable housing commitment, it actually put some pressure on to plan to those developers to bring forward those houses. And, and the developers make more money out of it yeah. without even having to stick a spade in the ground. Uh, is there anyone who has any sort of any questions or thoughts? Uh, I'll, I'll go through who haven't asked the question first and then. Uh, so the gentleman at the end of that row and then the gentleman further in on that row. Uh, Kyle Lowry, I'm from Trinidad. Um, the government in Trinidad has adopted a number of approaches to tackling this problem over years. 
one of the approaches is to make uh, plots of land available to individuals at quite low rates. In fact, it's so low that if you take up a plot, the government has also put a covenant on that plot. They can't sell it for 20 years, and they must live on it. So it's a protection. But my question, when we did that, an, an immediate problem arose because we need lots of lots of land. How did we control the price of building materials and the price of labor? Because then you had an immediate rush to what was the, you know, at that point in time, limited resource. How would the panel see that England? Well, I dream of the day that we're building so many houses that there is a rut, there is a, a bottleneck <laughs> in the supply of building fields. But uh, I mean. Is that partly going past right? Is that partly just Trinidad the way I'd imagine a, a lot of your materials have to be imported? Was it partly due to, or was it uh, no, domestic? We adopted, we adopted an approach before we did it. Yeah. So, for instance, the price of cement was controlled. Mm -hmm. That's mostly because the government owned most of the cement mm -hmm. produced in the industry. So, a number of measures. Uh, well, I actually share Alex's view, really, you know, come the day when we're in that problem. Um, I, I think, um, you know, the, here in the UK, the cost of the land is you know, a third to half of what, what most people want to build their own home, hopefully they're going to pay. Um, if they've got over that hurdle, actually, relatively, the building materials, compared to that, aren't that uh, difficult to, to swallow, even if the prices do go up a bit. I think... Uh, that's an assumption. Yeah. I'm thinking that's an assumption, because if you have a certain up in demand, a significant up in demand, what we thought of as being you know, a relative surplus might not exist at all. Even a 15% shift is large. Yeah, uh, but I think we're sort of talking about hypotheticals here that are mm. almost hard to imagine in the UK market. I think what I happen if there's, if, there's, if, there's, if, there's, if suddenly all these plots become available. What we will pull in are the customer goods from Holland and Sweden and from Germany will suddenly start to look at this as, as, a, as a realistic market. So we get more competition in the system built housing market. Which might balance out. If you're looking at system builds, the larger the volume, the cheaper the price. So, yeah. Yeah. Should we pass the microphone along that? I think there's a, there's a <coughs> lady as well. Oh no, we'll go to the man and the lady. Uh, Stephen Hill. Um, my question is. Um, how can we change the culture and improve the skills of planners, particularly development control people, who will need to deal with this? Um, and the kind of rationale for this question is, and I you know, sympathise with Ted hugely, you know, how can we not just have a really simple process that the Dutch have managed to create? But my thoughts of when I went to Almira was that if you took most development control people there, you'd have to treat them for post-traumatic stress disorder when they came home. Um, just the kind of the sheer dis in sense what appears to be the disorder and variety of different homes would give them great problems because they're obsessed with the appearance of individual houses rather than thinking that actually the quality of the place is described by the street and the way the street works. That's kind of one thing. Um, and the second is that it's probably truer for group schemes is that groups of people have very clear idea about how they want to live. And so they often think about arranging particularly the space between buildings quite differently from the way a house builder would do it. And again, often that doesn't fit with the kind of culture we've given ourselves now of kind of urban design, with a kind of whole raft of kind of things like, like um, uh, permeability, barrier blocks, all those kind of things that now that you've got one of those, you've got an urban design and a master plan that will work. And actually people want to live in a different way. So how would you change that? That's a slightly wider question than the customs bill. <laughs> um, and before I since I used to be the editor of Planning Magazine and the years gone by, when I first heard about what was happening in Germany and Holland, uh, where it was presented as a sort of fairly free reign in terms of what you could build on your plot, I thought I would go and see something that looked like a sort of shanty town from Suezo. The reality is, it's really very diverse and interesting, and architecturally, most people love it. One in 20 of the homes are bonkers, but frankly, I don't think that matters. I think it adds to the vibrancy and, uh, and, and creativity that's being expressed there. So, um, 
every, everyone I've ever taken to Almira, Almira is the sort of Milton Keynes of Holland where they're building thousands and thousands of cell phone apps. Any, anyone who ever goes there comes away as though they've had a sort of uh, road to the masses moment. You know, they are convinced afterwards that you can do it and all it requires you to do is ease off. The, the leader of Almira, the, 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 the council leader there, um, is a fantastic guy. Uh, people, we, we took a group of British property developers, big house builders and, and local authorities there, and there were all sorts of questions to him. One of the questions I remember was, do you, um, how do you check that the self-builders have installed the lavatories correctly and, and that the electrics are done to the right standards? And the leader of the council said, we trust people because we think they will want their shitters to work and they will not want to electrocute their children. <laughs> and we've sort of lost the habit of trusting people. We, our planning system sort of micromanages the whole bloody process from beginning to end to a preposterous level. Now you need good urban design, you need uh, proactive enabling planning, but you don't need to spend a month of Sundays de designing the, defining the brick that you must use on your chimneys, you know. It's gone completely too far in the wrong direction. We just need to trust people and let them run free. Actually, I'm going to ask, uh, with an eye for politics, so we proposed in our report in March that you could, what you have is a neighbourhood plan. The neighbourhood plan wouldn't say what you could build, it would say what you couldn't. So it might specify that you have to have some windows on your house. So it basically would ban the most wacky type of housing, but basically within that you'd have quite a free range to do what you like. So it basically would say, you can't just sort of go to middling the village and start building houses that look like some kind of ball queue, which would scare the crap out of everyone that don't know have it. But on the other hand, within quite a wide range of styles, you can do what you want. And I think that, that was trying to get to they, they have design codes in, in Almira. They, you know, you, have, you get a one-page piece of paper, it's called a plot passport, and it says the ridge height can't be more than 14 metres or 11 metres, and it's got to line up the other houses in the front. And sometimes it says all the houses in this street are going to be done in timber clad, and you might be required to clad yours in timber, but they don't write reams and reams and reams of stuff and go around the clipboards checking all the time, you know, so it's, it's very simple, very light touch, and I think we've got to sort of try and persuade planners that, you know, planners in their heyday created fantastic housing initiatives, all the new towns, all the garden cities, you know, driven by planners, you know, now planners are seen as a sort of um, nitpicking, micromanaging, um, anorak wearing, pains in the backside, and they, I don't think they want to be seen like that. I think most planners actually want to make stuff happen, and I think we've got to try and help them make stuff happen. I think our, experience, our, our experience with planners, I think they'll be grateful to see 300 individual houses rather than 300 standard developer boxes. The, the, like that the interesting thing for me is, of course, that there are actually lots of interesting uh, domestic examples as well of uh, custom build. So Bath Royal Crescent is a custom build. What happened was, uh, if anyone doesn't know Bath Royal Crescent, it's stunning and one of my favourite spa architecture. Um, the front of that is sort of like Georgian sandstone. On the back of it, you could do pretty much what you like. So they basically, you built it, if you were rich, you built one that went back far. If you were poor, you built one that didn't go back as much. They look, from the back, also fantastic. And from the front, they have sort of uniform, and that was actually basically custom built in the 18th century. I think one of the best examples of British architecture. I'm gonna go for the lady next to uh, the gentleman, and then the gentleman at the back. So I'm sort of from the Deputy Prime Minister's office. And I can certainly assert that uh, the Lindblends are very much behind uh, the self-build uh, component of increasing housing supply. Um, I'm still a servant, just to say, on the political side. Um, but one of the things that we're working uh, very uh, firmly with GCLG is on the land, the land market issue. Um, and I'm just interested by the comments that the lady made about uh, moving towards potentially a landed estate type way of um, well, it'd be an innovative way of disrupting the land market, and that's certainly the kind of ideas that we're looking at. But I suppose I would be perhaps more attracted to a more competitive market, because we know that in some parts of the um, country, uh, land ownership is very consolidated, and that brings its own problems. So I was wondering what the panel thought about the role of competition in the land market and how we can address that. That needs to be. Manager, well, I, I suppose, uh, to be really controversial here, um, at the moment you have no competition, or virtually no competition at all in the land market, because there's only one set of players. And if you, um, we, we have to, I, I suppose that, 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 that's my point, you have to create or enable more players to, to play in this market um, if you want to deliver more housing. It's, it, I think it's, it's, it's as simple as that. 
um, of course, extraordinarily difficult to achieve when we have no culture of, or not for 200 years, you know, the culture of, of, a, of a landowner developer. Um, and I, I suppose, um, I suppose the nearest we come to it recently are the new town corporations. Uh, that that sort of um, uh, uh, organisation. Uh, so I think we do have to go overseas and have a look at the many, many different ways of, of doing things. Um, I think that we should, we should be aware of going in with the int intention to disrupt um, a market because the plain fact is at the moment we are completely and utterly dependent for delivery on the speculative house builders. And um, you've got to kind of manage things to keep them going and delivering at the rate they're delivering and think about things in addition. If all we do is swap one player for another, we haven't achieved what's needed. So um, that requires a, a, a ver a, an understanding of a very, very complex area where there are interactions from all sorts of, of sites, not just the land supply side, but the money and finance side and the, 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 the players themselves and the different business models involved. And I think without that kind of complex knowledge of that complex interaction, you could end up, if you're not careful, doing so, throwing a complete spanner in the works. Don't put the lift ends off the formula, Ander. It's, uh, it's hard enough to get policies to, to want to do reform in this area, but you're right, it is a complication. I'm, I'm saying not, you you not do don't reform, just be really careful about how you do it. Could, could I just add a little this is a fantastic statistic? Three out of four people would never want one of the products that the volume house builders build, right? The reason they sell them, the shoeboxes, the, you know, the smallest homes in Europe for the highest price, is because of the supply and demand situation. Three quarters of us would never buy one of those. And what this would do is open up a market for the three quarters who want something customised, want something bespoke. And it's that market, and I think it is going to need public sector initiatives like the new towns almost taking off again. There are a thousand homes here, a thousand homes there, driven by visionary local authorities who are keen to give people a, a chance to get the homes they really want. Yes, and I, I, I do agree that if, if, if we achieve that, or you know, some kind of new supply, um, the, the need for regulation on design, I think, would start to disappear because there would simply be competition against what people really want in a building for themselves. And paradoxically, of course, the huge amounts of regulation we have actually discourages competition and makes it harder. You said as planning is the second issue. So we have a weird situation where we have a small number of large house builders because the people see quality isn't good enough, we have huge amounts of micromanagement, which then means it's harder for people who want to do custom build. So we sort of then continue down the road of, of where you know, I, I find it. So this area can be quite depressing as you sort of work out sort of there are all kinds of unhelpful feedback loops. Uh, it's gone 10 uh, par past. I'm going to have to continue for another 10 minutes or so. If anyone urgently needs to leave, feel free to go. Um, sorry, I think the gentleman at the back, then we'll go forward to the gentleman at the front. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the Nicholas Smith and the Director of Great Streets. Ted, we, um, we've got a report coming out home tomorrow that actually picks up on your points about the more you micromanage, the less you get and the, the, the less effective it is. Two sort of quick comments slash questions on self build The first is, uh, I've read this somewhere in behavioural economics, for big financial decisions, people tend to only make them when they've seen the decision in the root models. Right, it's just not something you pick up rationally, it's something you've observed or spoken to someone who's done it. So it's not scary buying a house in the open market because you all know people who have. Um, my wife is English. I observe that when I am in France, I quite regularly, not every day, not every week, meet someone who has built their own house. Were I living in France, I would know exactly what to do to build my own house. I would find someone who has done it, talk to them, and feel much more self-confident about it. So just a thought would be, I think, championing the people who have done it so that their stories as stories, not as rational. Are you effect. suggesting that Kevin McLeod, where everyone is Kevin McLeod? No, no, I'm McLeod. helpful actually, because it, it's so grand and impossible and expensive for most people, and so beyond what most of us can imagine simply conceive of doing. I think we always need to go down the water. But the second sort of thought on the question is there a sort of halfway house here between uh, volume house builders and pure self building? Maybe it's custom building, I don't know my terminology. Um, picking up on the Bath Crescent point, Actually, that wasn't unique. Most of the streets and squares half a mile from here were built on that model. Actually, it wasn't typically self-built. It was people, small builders, small developers, SMEs as we now call them, the architectural practice built, you know, buying a plot, or five, or ten, or six, depending on what they could afford to do. And I think as we talk about self-builds, we talk about you know, new third sector for long-term landlordship, we should be thinking not just of the person building the house they're going to live in, 
but about the small enterprise, the small architect, buying five, getting a bit of financing to do that, doing a plot in a certain way, and moving on. I think that will enrich the model as we try to put our philosophies back together. Um, I mean, Kevin is a great ambassador on the telly. You know, there's four million people watch his program. But, um, you know, short, short, short surprise, they choose the wackiest, maddest buildings because it makes more interesting TV and it's, you know, it's, it's architectural porn and we all go and watch it. Um, the reality of most self-builds is that they're much, they look like everybody else's house, you know. The vast majority of them, nine out of ten of them, look like any other house. You drive past them all day and you don't realise they've been self-built. Well, they're bigger, they're slightly bigger, aren't they? They are generally... They are slightly, slightly better quality. The, most self-builders at the moment, sweeping generalisation, but most self-builders are people in their 50s and 60s currently who are building the dream retirement home. So they tend to build slightly bigger homes and perhaps people if they were in their 30s or 40s would or could afford to build. Um, so you're right, I mean, whilst it makes great TV, the reality is very different. And, and just to get your heads into gear here on this, self-build, pure self-build, where people roll up the sleeves and lay bricks and do plastering is barely one in ten of all the homes that are called self built at the moment. You know. The vast majority of self built homes are built by your small builders. Or, you know, and it's very much small builders and architects who drive it along, or kit home companies. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it, we do have to sort of adjust people's um, perceptions of it. Um, because, but TV's, TV's interested in the extreme stuff. I, just, I think also self build is incredibly uh, contagious. If one person builds build themselves a home, it's not unusual for them, a friend of the family or another you know, family member go and do the same thing. And then the children go and do the same thing, and then the schools you learn. So actually, if we get more people doing it, or they will uh, snowball. But it's, it go back to your analogy in France. You know, in France, nearly every mayor will have a field on the edge of his village or town that is bought by the Marie to convert into little building plots to sell off to local people at a modest price. And it's as easy as falling off a log to buy a plot of land on the outskirts of most French um, settlements. Depressingly, this comes back to the, uh, the, the planning units in Britain are much larger than other countries or some of the other countries, which means it's politically not worth your while. It may not be as council. Whereas if you are at a small village or where is it in France, and Germany has very small planning authorities, that th those voters are just constitute a sizable chunk of your electorate. Yeah. The problem is in Britain, you've got you know Birmingham, a city of a million. For them to invest the time is you know, doesn't have the same physical payoff. I think again it comes back to the, the sort of general problem in this area. There are so many couple of feedback. Well, it's nine hundred nine hundred ninety nine thousand people. Sorry, nine hundred ninety thousand people last year who wanted to build um, couldn't build it. So some political party does come along and switches that tap on, that's a lot of votes. You know, parish, tight, parish councils, I wonder, yeah, parish councils might have the... Uh, parish councils are really good at getting sites. It's a fantastic example in, in Devon, where um, there's an organisation called the Land Society, which has gone around parish councils saying to them, we'll help you build affordable homes for local people. You need to find us some building plots at 10 grand each. That's your total maximum budget. And they found 150 plots very easily, because the parish councils know the farmers who want to buy a new combine harvester and they'll do a deal to flog a field to do it. Okay, uh, the gentleman there, the gentleman there, and the gentleman there, then we're done. I think uh, we we'll have to let everyone go. Just on this terminology point, um, I wonder if I could invite his head to give us his definitions of self-build and custom-build. Yeah. <laughs> Here I go. Uh, um, self-build is when you get really quite involved in doing it, uh, whether you're physically building it, that would be what or pure DIY self-build, or whether you may be managing different subcontractors yourself, you know, so you're project managing it or doing a lot of the thinking, planning, running of the job. That would be my definition of self-build. Custom build is where an intermediary helps you do it. So it could be a developer, it could be a community facilitator, or somebody like that, who sort of helps you de-risk it. They're an expert, they run shotgun for you, and they help you avoid the things that Hang up, bang and hurt, uh, and they all you know, deliver your home in a fairly sort of painless way. Um, you might not make as much saving if you do it brilliantly well yourself, but then you know it's a good case for you know, hiring an expert who knows what they're doing. Um, and, and I think it will be less risky if people go to a custom builder uh, in the time to come. Yeah, 
I was just going to say that the, the key thing from our perspective, we the design buildings and do planning consultancy in mainly, mainly rural areas, is the release of uh, what's called greenfield land, but I would call it redundant uh, rural land. Um, there isn't enough suitable brownfield sites, this might probably say to meet the demand. And yet, if a, a, a mayor, in your example, found a bit of land on the edge of his village, uh, on an English model, then they wouldn't be allowed, they wouldn't get planning permission for it because of the current planning system. It is hardwired to say no to any rural building. And, and everybody, the CPR, and everybody else gets. But so you, you that was, the there needs green. to be more creative engagement about that greenfield land. I wonder, if there's, greenfield a, land. I wonder if there's a question here about greenbelt land and parish councils having a greater say on the release of. Because obviously, lots of areas that are high demand are, might be parish councils within a green belt, but where certainly you politically can't get rid of a green belt, but you could, certainly could say if the parish wants to allow 100 self-built homes. The community right to build is a pretty... Uh, we just fought a, a big case where uh, a guy... You've got to prove exceptional circumstances for a, a small self-build in the countryside. It has to be agriculture or forestry. And we just fought a big case. It's going to be on the next series of the planners, BBC2, which is about this very issue. And it, it, it's, uh, it's took two years and involved a guy nearly going to jail, you know, uh, to get... Um, so there's only extreme kind of people who will try it uh, because of the system. It needs to be more creative engagement about how we release more so-called greenfield or greenbelt or rural land um, without the fear of destroying the countryside. It's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. You know? I'd go back to my point earlier on. You know, if there was a village with 500 homes and there's clear demand from local families for new homes that are a reasonable price and they see self-build perhaps as the way of delivering it and they want to build 10 new homes. There won't be an awful lot of objection to that as opposed to somebody who wants to build 50 new executive homes for incomers. There will be, the NIMBYs will go crazy for the latter. I think self-build generally is a lot less um, difficult to get through, although you know, never be there are people who object. National policy is still hardwired to say no to rural building. Yes, yeah, so, so you have to use neighbourhood plans or community right to build or some of these other new things that the government's brought in, which can be quite effective as well. keep pushing to change the national uh, framework. Um, get there, So you just. Yeah, I just wonder whether um, self built has been hijacked by the, the four or five bedroom houses, um, you know, all the magazines, all the, all the shows, they all, uh, they all promote the uh, top end of the market. Uh, yeah, rea reality at the moment is we're, we're quite good at building those actually. Mm -hmm. focusing our objectives here on delivery of affordable housing and um, through through self-build or custom build models, you know, and really sort of say that's what we're going to do rather than just supplement that market that's already uh, well catered for. Although if you build lots of houses, one of the interesting things for me was between 1997 and 2010 and 2007 when house prices boomed, we built quite a lot of small flats, the argument being that we need to build the Labour Party used to argue what you need to do because housing is getting more expensive was build cheaper houses. Which actually meant, which actually was hard because people tended to prefer, well not always, people tended to prefer houses that were slightly more expensive and had bigger gardens near them. So it was hard to get planning permission, so we built less houses. So I, 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 sorry, I, I worry, I don't, the market segmentation, if you build lots of houses of any size, housing gets and stays cheaper. So I think there is a danger in going, well, you should build cheap houses because housing is getting expensive. Uh, no, sorry, I'm not saying cheap housing, I'm saying by building houses that are affordable. Focus on the affordable In local communities and that sort of thing. And, and actually, you know, take a different view of the land value because it's like maybe like a priority over or whatever. But to live in those houses for people who like, you know, um, who need to live in those areas. It's, 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 it's interesting. Work. If you look at uh, what's, uh, Berlin at the moment, it's wash with collective self builds It's where groups of people get together and build Collectively, if you build together collectively, you get a lot of economies of scale. If you're building together as a group, you're not paying the 20% shareholders' profit margin that a big listed company would probably need to generate. You're not having to shell out for the marketing because you've already got your group together. And so in, in Berlin, they're building some absolutely fantastic new apartments, 25% cheaper than anything else that anybody else can build. And it's groups of people getting exactly the homes they want. 
for a quarter less. And that's the sort of model that needs to roll out over here. And we have, have to make, I think, make the argument that the collective is the only way to deliver the urban. Yeah. Because otherwise you're going to be talking about uh, rural and greenfield sort of uh, uh, plots all the time. But, I mean, nobody's, for example, talked about shell and corn, that, you know, the potential, you know, and I, I'm, I'm just nervous about where people sort of put that, and is, 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 is that a developer pretending itself built, or a, uh, or is it genuine self-built? And the, the fact is that a lot of it's hybrid. I think there's actually a huge amount of um, public owned uh, existing buildings that could be split up for shell and corn. Effectively, mm. you know, yeah, all yeah, the council sell them yeah. by the foot. <laughs> and you want this many bays and windows. If, you're allowed, uh, if, if, you, if you're part of the non designated areas where you're allowed to convert, well, yeah, yeah. And, which just doesn't include any committed developments, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, well, um, that's the end of it. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and. Uh, feel free to leave or come and harass our panel members uh, individually. Um, thank you very much for coming and uh, hope to see you again.